Nothing can separate Even if I ran away Your love never fails I know I still make mistakes But you have new mercies for me every day Your love never fails You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning rage I don't have to be afraid because I know that you love me your love never fails the wind is strong and the water's deep but I'm not alone here in these open seas your love never fails The chasm is far too wide I never thought I'd reach the other side Your love never fails You stay the same Ages. Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never fades together for my good you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good you make all things work together for my good you stay You stay the same through the ages Your love never changes There may be pain in the night But joy comes in the morning And when the oceans rage I don't have to be afraid Because I know that you love me Your love never Sin, 
suffered as if he did all authority every victory is yours all authority every victory Awesome and power forever. Awesome and great is your name. You overcame. Power in hand, speaking the Father's plan. Sending us out. Died in this broken land. All authority, every victory is yours. All authority, every. Of our testimony, everyone overcome. We will overcome by the blood of the Lamb and the word of our testimony. Everyone overcome. Of our testimony, everyone overcome. Savior, worthy of honor and glory, worthy of all our praise, you overcame. Jesus, awesome and Jesus, awesome in power forever, awesome and great is your name, you Say
should be your name in the land that is plentiful where your streams of abundance flow blessed be your name blessed be your name when I'm found in the desert place though I walk through the wilderness blessed be your name This week we'll be in, in Judges uh, chapter number 7, and if you want to go there. And, uh, last, last week we, we began to look at this man Gideon, and we were introduced to him, and we saw the situation of, of Israel was that uh, they were being totally oppressed in, in that day by, the, by people called the Midianites. And, uh, and we see a cycle of, of Israel turning to the Lord and then turning away, and as they turn away, hard things come to them. And, and at each time, their hardship got worse. And, and at the point we're at with Gideon, the, their situation had become so difficult that they had abandoned the villages in the land that God had given to them. They were living in the mountains and dens and caves. And, and we learned that every growing season they would plant crops and, and hope to have a harvest and just before the harvest would come the, the Gideonites would come up the, the hills and the mountains and, and harvest the Israel, Israeli crops and, and although the Bible doesn't use that word we, we can know from that situation that they, they, were, they were starving to death and this had gone on for seven years and they finally started crying out to, to the Lord and, and the Lord sends the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ and he finds this man Gideon, and and we went through how how Gideon had had asked for confirmation with with the fleece. And everyone everyone I think knows about Gideon and his fleece. You know, in Christian lingo, somebody will talk about like, are you putting out the fleece on that one? Are you looking for confirmation? And that's where we're at as we get to chapter seven and verse one it says, "And Jerobabel, which is Gideon, uh, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the wall of Herod." so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill of Mora in the valley. So, you know, I, as we go into this, I, I want to remind you that for uh, some time recently now, 
I've been pointing out over and over and over again that one person with God on his or her side forms an overwhelming majority. Uh, and we'll, we'll see that. that I've been pointing out that one, one person being used by God in any situation uh, can overcome any foe that is presented to them. That, and you need to know this. You need to remember this, that, that God will always give you what you need for the thing that he is calling you to, that God will always provide every need in that. He, he, God's never going to send you into something that uh, he doesn't give you the provision for that thing. So in, in this chapter we come to today, God has called Gideon to be a judge or a deliverer of Israel. And, and we have the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ here talking with him. And, and as, as you read the chapter, you see that Jesus wanted to make sure that the people would see, that the people would acknowledge what God was doing. That he, Jesus wanted to make sure that they would see that they were delivered from this Midianite oppression by God and not themselves. So Jesus decided that he was going to uh, level the playing field. Remember, one person with God is an overwhelming majority. We don't see it that way. We don't see it that way. At, at verse 2, it says, And the Lord said, Again, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. They're too many. Lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. He's saying, Jesus is saying again, and if, if I let all you folks go into this battle and you win, you're going to give yourself the glory, where God deserves the glory. At verse 3, Now therefore go to proclaim in the ears of people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there returned to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. Now, fleece or no fleece, this was going to be a great test of the faith of Gideon. His army of thirty-two thousand. He had. We saw last week. He had an army of thirty-two thousand. They were already mat, outmatched by the Midianites, who had one hundred thirty-five thousand. Thirty-two thousand to one hundred thirty-five thousand. Jesus looks at that and he says, "You have too many folks here." So he says, whoever is afraid, get in. you tell whoever is afraid, go home. Now, you should understand, if you look at verses 1 and 8, that Israel was assembled. They were living in the mountains, remember, and the Midianites were in the valleys. They were assembled at a point where they had a, a vantage point. They could see the Midianites gathered below. They could see that there was a lot of them. And, and as a result of the 32,000 men that Gideon had, 22,000 of them went home, leaving him with only 10,000 men. And I don't know about you, but if I were in getting sandals, I would have been disheartened by that. Uh, same way that I tell you it's important for you to be in church. You know, and I, when I was becoming a pastor, I would have never thought this, but the bigger the crowd, the easier it is for me to preach. I come in here on, on a week when there's 20 people, and I, that's hard. It's disheartening to me. And I, I start doing all this self-doubting stuff. It's like maybe my preaching's no good. Maybe I'm doing something wrong. Maybe this, maybe that. Not looking like God is able. So, so it's important that you are here. It's important for everyone else's worship experience. You have responsibility to everyone else here. I have responsibility to stand here. You have responsibility to be there. And, and for, to let other people have a better experience because you're here. Uh, so so 32,000 men gathered with getting the fight. 22,000 went home. And in this, you see, again, Jesus wasn't going to leave any room at all for Israel to walk away from this approaching battle, thinking that they had won the victory. So verse 4, he says, he says there's still too many. Getting, you still have too many folks, too many men. Just bring them down to the water. So, you know, again, put yourself in Gideon's shoes. There's 135,000 Midianites down there. And Jesus had just sent most two-thirds of your men home, and he looks at you and he says, there's still too many of you. I, I think if you could hear swallowing, you would have heard Gideon swallow hard right about then. Uh, you got to get rid of some more. So he, he, Jesus told Gideon to let the men go and drink from the stream and, and watch them as they drank. And, 
and that some are going to stoop down and they're going to put their faces in the water to drink and others are going to cup water up with their hand they're going to lap it out of their hand like a dog and and getting I want you to only keep the men who lap water like a dog for battle send the rest of them back to their tents we don't need them uh, now you can you can go to commentaries and I always always want you to go into commentaries and you can read lots of ideas uh, on why Jesus used this specific test and I will tell you with all certainty I don't know why I don't know why this test uh, why, why Jesus used this to, as a sorting method I, I have some ideas but I don't know why for sure but I do know that when this sorting was over the side were going to be uh, they're, going, they're going to appear so lopsided to the people of Israel they were going to have no option when they were victorious but to give God the glory. And God wants the glory. God deserves the glory. They were going to have no choice but see that God had gained a victory. Now, I'm going, to, I'm going to speculate a bit. And I always tell you when I speculate, but I would suggest that if we look at this situation with a, with a subjective eye, we should see, I think God is showing us something of the spiritual battle that the church faces. Something of church membership. There are those in church and there are those in every church who are afraid of the enemy. They don't understand the power that God has. They're afraid of the enemy and as soon as spiritual battle begins, they turn and they tuck their tails and they run. And this, I think, is the first group that we saw, the ones that are scared. Then there's another group that, that are, they're in the church because they're greedy. They're in the church because of what I can get for myself, what the church can do for me. They're in the church because they want to get everything they can get out of the church, and they want to do it as conveniently as possible. And, and those, those folks are too self-centered instead of God-centered to be of any use to the church, and therefore they're not fit for battle. And they're the second group that God send, sent home. They were just like those who, those men who would, when it came time to drink, they would put all cares for anyone or anything else aside and focus on the water. They'd, they'd fall on, on, their, on their knees and they'd put their face to the water, gr drink in greedily. Not, no concern for anything else. And then there's a few who remain. There's just a few who remain uh, who are ready and willing to engage in the spiritual battles of the church. And there are spiritual battles, and, and as a church, we participated in them this week some. So God had already reduced Gideon's army from, from 32,000 to, to 10,000. Uh, here he reduces it again from 10,000 to 300. And, uh, you know, we, we look at this, and we look at, we look at our lives and, and what we experience. And there's very uh, few people who think that bigness can be a hindrance to God. We don't think that way. We don't think that bigness can be a hindrance to the move of God. But, uh, you know, I, I think we're, we're a little church here, and we have this tendency, whether or not we want to admit, we have a tendency that, that we can drive around the area, and, and we look at these big churches who have deep pockets full of money, and, and we, we, we look, can look at them and we think, wow, man, the resources they have. They have so much money that they can do so much, and we have just, in comparison, we have just a little bit with which to do anything. And, you know, for example, I know there's one Warsaw church that collects more in the offering plate in a year than we do, uh, I'm sorry, in a week than we do here in a whole year. And that's true. And we can look at them and say, you know, that, that's extraordinary, and it is, and I, I can look at that and say, man, what we could do if we had if we had half of that money. But there's something more important than money. There's more important things than those financial resources. And the problem is that it's it's more difficult to truly rely on God in those big churches with those deep pockets. It's hard to rely on God when you have a, a great amount of money to work with that you can seem to do anything. There seems like there's nothing out of reach. And I'll tell you what, the big churches, they do a lot. I, I won't take that away from them. They do a lot, and a lot of them 
uh, invest in, in the mission field, but, but it comes to the point where Jesus was working on getting here. You know, I, I, if you were here in January, the first week, I think the first week of January, I took a whole week and, I, and we reviewed what God has done through this church in the past year, and it's astounding. And, and we step back, we pause, and we pause, and we step back, and we look, and we say, look what God has done. Now, now project yourself into the one, one of the big churches in the area, and how often do you suppose they do that? How often, if and when they pause, do you think they say, look what God has done, or do they say, aren't we good to look at what we have accomplished? You see the difference in that? See the difference in who's getting the glory? Uh, you know, I, we, I know we come several points every year. I, I stand here and say, I can't believe what God has done with us. I can't believe what he's done. And uh, he gets the glory, and, and I can't believe and, uh, what, he's, what he does through us. And I, I thank him for that. So, so this is what Jesus was doing with Gideon. Maybe it's what he does with us on an ongoing basis here and, and keeping us somewhat small and manageable. That, that Jesus was working this out with Gideon, that there was no space or no opportunity to say, look at what we have done. Aren't we grand? Because we're not. No one is. Only God is grand. Only God is good. So, so Jesus had Gideon and his men here where they, if they were going to have a victory, and they were going to have a victory, uh, they were going to have to trust in the Lord for it. Because if they had no trust in the Lord, they were going to be wiped out in moments, literally moments. And that's the same place that we exist, that either we will trust in the Lord or we will not exist because it would be so, we're so small, it would be so easy to wipe us out. At verse 7 it says, The Lord said to Gideon, by the 300 men that lapped, I will save you and deliver the Midianites into that hand and let all the other people go every man to his place. So, so then Jesus tells Gideon to, since you're scared, take, take your servant named Pura. I, don't, I want you to sneak down tonight. I want you to go sneak in the dark down to the Midianite camp, and I want you to see them firsthand, and I want you to hear what they will say. And you should begin to see how God is developing the faith of Gideon step by step. He's building his faith, and he's doing the same thing in your own life. The step by step, God is building faith in your life if you will be obedient to him, if you will participate. He can't force you. He can't force you to have faith. He can't force you to be obedient. That's a choice that you make. But if, if you will take that step, as I said in prayer, as we answered today, if you will take that step, step, God comes, Jesus comes rushing the rest of the way. He does most of the work. But if you want to be a person of faith, if you want to be used by God, you're going to have to start doing the little thing. You're going to have to start practicing. You're going to have to start doing the little things that God's calling to you so when a big opportunity is presented that you're exercised and you're ready. Because if you don't do the little things, when the big thing comes, you're going to be like the rest of these men were and you're going to run to the tent and you're going to zip the flap closed and you're going to sit there with your knees knocking. You have decisions to make. Which group do you want to be in? You want to run because you're scared? You want to come to church just for what you can get, what the church can do for you? Or do you want to be obedient to God? Do you want to be a participant in the spiritual warfare that he sets before you? If that's where you want to live, there are things that you need to do. You need to be in a prayerful life. You need to be in conversation with God. You need to be sensitive to what he's putting on your heart, and you need to do it. It's your responsibility. You know, things have gotten better over the last several years, but too often when there comes something to do, everyone says the pastor should go do it. The pastor should go visit so-and-so. And you divert your eyes so no one looks at you and thinks that maybe you should go. You should go. You have a responsibility to Jesus Christ. You have a responsibility to everyone else that goes to this church. 
Either you're a family or you're not. Or are you laying on your belly gulping as much water as you can get? We're already small. We can't afford for two-thirds of you not to be participating. So Gideon, he was obedient. He was doing these small things that God was starting to work something into him. He's starting to build faith into him. And with his knees, I think, knocking, he and his servant snuck down to the camp of the Midianites in the dark and he saw firsthand and up close that these people were as numerous as locusts and they had camels un innumerable. That I have 300 folks, how am I going to do anything with these people? But God had plans. And there in the dark, Gideon comes close to a tent of one of the enemy's soldiers and he overheard a man inside talking about a dream he had. Verse 13, it says, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and lo, a cake of barley bread tumbled in the host of Midian and came into a tent and smote it that fell and overturned it. And the tent lay along. Now, to best understand this, you need to understand that in this day, only the poor people ate barley, that the rest of them ate wheat. And so, Remember, the Midianites are in the valley, the Israelites are up in the hills and in the mountains. So this was clear, it was a clear vision to them that the barley cake rolling down the hill, there was no one else but Israel. This is an easy representation to understand for them. And verse 14, it says, And this fellow answered, another guy in the tent answered and said, This is nothing else save the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. For into his hand has God delivered Midian and all the hosts... He's saying, God is delivering us into this man's hand. This is what this means. Now stop and, stop and see what's before your eyes. Do you think they had spies? Do you think the Midianites had spies in Israel? I think they did. I think they knew full well that, I don't think they understood who Jesus was, but I think they knew full well that, this was going on, this conversation was transponding between Jesus and Gideon. And, uh, otherwise, how would they know about Gideon, the son of Joash, this man who cowered in a wine press gleaning wheat? I think they had spies. So the Midianites, because they knew some things, they knew what was going on, uh, they took this dream as a foreboding Premonition that we're about to be defeated by this man Gideon and, and the, the God that, that he's serving. And Gideon hears this. He, he's at the tent and he hears this. And hearing this, he, grasps, he finally grasps the fact that God had already prepared the victory for Israel. That God had already set the victory in front of them. That the enemy was already talking defeat and they hadn't done anything yet. That despite the fact that they were only 300 men left, that they were an overwhelming majority with the Lord on their side. And remember, if you were here last week, I told you last week that God, when he views you, he views you in your life complete. Not bound by time. Not, he doesn't view you in the moment. He doesn't just view you in your, what you've done up to now. He views your life complete, and, and he sees you right now. He sees you not only in what you have done, but in what you will do. And this is what's happening right here, that God is allowing Gideon to see or to glimpse a confirmation of his future work, of what God is going to do with him. And you need to know that God has set victories ahead of you if you'll move that direction. Look at Gideon's choice here. God has set the victory ahead of him. What would have happened if Gideon would have chose to retreat? Do you see that? The victory wouldn't be realized. God has victories in your life ahead of you. Will you travel to them? Will you claim those victories? And you look at this situation in, in, in God's kingdom. I've told you over and over and over again, there is no such thing in God's kingdom as coincidence. It wasn't a coincidence. It wasn't luck. 
that this man dreamed this dream this night, that God put this dream in his head. It wasn't an accident that he told his friend about at the exact moment that Gideon was outside in the dark hearing. There's no coincidences. God was doing things to build the faith of Gideon. God authored this situation before it was realized by Gideon. He's authoring things in your life. Will you step into them? Well, this, this was pretty effective in Gideon's life. He was so overcome, he was so overcome by God's grandeur that he, he couldn't help but start to worship. I think, I think in the darkness at this tent, this is probably a silent kind of worship, don't you? Like, oh my gosh, can you believe what God's done? I can hear him whispering with his servant. Praise God. Well, Gideon hurries, the Bible tells us Gideon hurries back to the camp of Israel and he, he tells the men to, I imagine there's excitement. It tells them to get up out of your tents and prepare for battle because God has delivered the Midianites into our hands. And so God, I'm sorry, Gideon divides the 300 men into three companies of 100 men each. And he equipped each man with a trumpet in one hand and a lamp in a clay pot in the other hand. Now, I don't know about you, but if I had 300 folks that I was going to go fight 135,000 with, I probably wouldn't arm them with a trumpet and a candle. <laughs> But Gideon tells him, he, he said, follow my lead. And uh, he had, had the three, three uh, groups of 100 arrange themselves on the hillsides around the, the camp of the Midianites. And Gideon said, when I blow my trumpet, I want you all to blow your trumpet too. Let's wake them up out of their sleeping bags. And, and then when they have just enough, follow my lead, when they have just enough time to come in their sleep out of their tents, I want you to break the clay pot that's hiding the light of your lamp, and they're going to think they're surrounded. They're going to, they're going to come out to the noise, and they're going to see lights all around the hillsides, and, and uh, we're, we're going to put a stir into them. And, and as soon as they come out of the tent and they see the lights, uh, I want you all, we'll all yell in unison because of what I heard them say, what they're scared of, the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. So... Gideon and his 300 men, they, they do exactly this. They surround the Midianite camp. It tells us that in the middle watch, so it was about midnight when the guys were sleeping pretty well. They blew the trumpets. They broke the clay pots, uh, exposing their lights, and the Midianite soldiers awaken. They, they start coming out of their tents, and they agree with this explosion, this explosion of noise and light. And uh, it, seems like, it seems like they're surrounded. There's chaos in every direction, and... Uh, they, they, they thought that they were being attacked by this bigger army than what they were. And just as they come out of their tents, they, they hear this cry, this cry from the hillside, just the sword of the Lord and of Gideon. And, and then Gideon had them blow their, their trumpets another time. So noise and confusion. And, and they're, the Midianites are down here in the dark. And it seemed like chaos. The place explodes with chaos. And uh, the Midianites begin to run, and they're convinced that they're under attack. And as they're encountering other people in the dark, each with their sword, they're convinced that the other people that they're encountering in the dark is, is an Israelite, and they start fighting each other and killing each other. Isn't it, isn't it something what God can do? Uh, so so they, they're, they're beginning to run away, and they're, they're killing each other as they go. And, and you should see that, that the army of Gideon was just perfectly small enough for God to use. Just like this church is just perfectly small enough for God to use. Uh, and what is, what's seen is, you know, if, if we really believe the biblical principle found in Zechariah 4, 6, not by not might nor by power, but by, by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts, then we should see and we should understand that our smallness doesn't matter. If we understand and believe the principle that's found in Psalms 27, some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we will remember the name of the Lord our God, then our smallness doesn't matter. We sh shouldn't look at ourselves as a small church and say there's nothing we can do. We look at ourselves and, there's, and we say there's so much that God can and is doing that it's astounding. And it's true. All that matters in any situation is the greatness of God. And if you are with him or if you are without him, if you are without him, I pity you. 
at verse 24, it says, the Gideon sent messengers throughout all Mount Ephraim, saying, Come down against the Midianites and take before them the waters into Bethbara and Jordan. Then all the men of Ephraim gathered themselves together and took the waters to Bethbara and Jordan. So what happened here is Gideon, the Midianites are on the run, and Gideon gives word to the Ephraimites, who rightfully own this area, come down and reclaim what God had given you. And it says, and, and the people of Ephraim did exactly that. And we, as we turn into verse 8, he began to learn something about the tribe of Ephraim that they were, and we'll get into it later, the wise, but they were a proud and uh, somewhat of an obstinate people. And, and they come down and begin to make accusations against Gideon. It's, this is a problem for us. Why, why didn't you call us to fight against the Midianites with you? Why, but they're always saying, why are you going to get the credit for this? Why are you getting the credit for this? Even despite the fact that they show up when the Midianites, when the enemy are on the run is when they show up. You know some people like this? That they, they want to show up when the work is done and they, they want to say, look, look what we did. Look what we did. Aren't we great? Uh, verse, chapter 8, verse 1, it says, And the men of Ephraim said unto him, Why hast thou served us thus? Why have you treated us like this, that thou callest not when you went to fight the Midianites? And they chided with him sharply. He said to them, What have I done now in comparison to you? Is not the glean of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abizir? God has delivered in your hands the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. And what was I able to do in comparison to you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he said that. So, so the men of Ephraim come down there wanting some credit for the defeat of the Midianites. And, and they were jealous, see? And jealousy has no place in the church. Jealousy, always, jealousy will always hinder the work of God has no place. Well, Gideon knew some things. Gideon knew how Jesus had set up this battle. He knew that he had no credit for this victory. He knew that. So and he, he, was also, he also had some wisdom, and he responded. He says, what have I done in comparison to you folks? You captured some kings. I've just chased them. You captured kings. I just chased them. All I've been doing is I've been doing the 100-yard dash. I'm out of breath, and I've got no time for you. So, you know, if you want the glory, take the glory. You, you caught these guys as they ran by. And it seems to appease them. In verse 4, it says, And the Gideon came to Jordan and passed over he and the 300 men that were with them, faint yet pursuing them. So they were still in pursuit of, of 15,000 of the Midianites who were, were running away. That means 100, and if you're doing the math, that means 120,000 of them had killed each other. Isn't that astounding? Primarily by each other. I'm sure Gideon's men killed a few. But it had been a long night and, and they were tired. And Are you, are you seeing the details you read? There, there's a detail there that's significant. And the, the detail is that Gideon went into this battle with 300 men. Gideon still has 300 men and not a single Israelite was killed in this while Midian lost 120,000. Is that not astounding? Do you see what God is doing? And so, but they were tired of being long nights, so they come to the, the city of Succoth, which is a Jewish city, and Gideon said to the Jewish men there, hey, give, give us something to eat. Give some bread to my men. Help us to keep fighting this fight by simply feeding us. And uh, look, at, look at what he's doing. He's not even, in, he's not even encouraging them to or asking them to join in the battle. He's just saying, give us some provisions here. Help fuel us. And the people of Succoth responded by saying, look, is the enemy in your hand? Are they defeated? I don't think so. I see 300 of you, and we just saw 15,000 of them run by. And if, if we give you food, and uh, these odds look pretty insurmountable, if we give you food and they turn around and defeat you and they find out that we gave you food, they're going to come back on us. So you're on your own. So Gideon says, when, uh, when I return with their heads, I'm going to whip you with thorns. I'm going to teach you something. And so he went, went on to the next city, which is Peniel, and he asked them also for food, food and they too refused to help and Gideon said, I'll tell you what, when I come back 
from the victory, I'm going to tear your tower down. Now, how discouraging would this be? You're, you're fighting for Israel with just 300 men. You're not asking anyone else to do anything but give you a little food, and they refuse. They refuse you. They were unwilling to help, and they had excuses. But churches are full of people unwilling to help and making excuses, aren't they? They were doing all the work, and they were meeting resistance by people who were also going to benefit. As you start yourself uh, setting out to do the Lord's work, you're going to find this in your own life. You're going to find that you begin to meet resistance from your own people. In our context, that means most of the time from our own families. But you've got to be like a Gideon. You can't let a little bit of resistance stop you from doing what the Lord would have you do. You gotta, you gotta press on. So he and his three hundred men continued the pursuit of the Midianites, and uh, the people Midian. They finally put enough distance they thought between them and Gideon that they they settled down for the night. They set up a tent, and and Gideon and his three hundred men keep pressing on. They find them there in the nighttime and they they wipe them out. They they kill the other fifteen thousand. So all in all, one hundred thirty five thousand people of Midian destroyed. At verse 13 it said, the Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle before the sun was up, so still at night. He caught a young man of the men of Succoth and inquired of him, and he described to him the princes of Succoth and the elders thereof, even three score and seventy, and, I'm sorry, seventeen men. He came to the men of Succoth and said, Behold Zeba and Zamuna, with whom you did upbraid me, saying, Are you the hands of Zeba and Zamuna now in thy hand? So they had the hands of these two folks to prove that they were dead. Uh, now that we should give bread unto the men that are weary. He took the elders to see in thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. I think this is a lesson you wouldn't want to be on the wrong end of. So, so they found this young man and made him finger who the leaders of the city were and Gideon punished them. Uh, just as he promised that he would to teach him a lesson. Then it says he returned to the other city of Peniel where uh, they dismantled or they tore down the tower of the city and, and they killed the men who were living there. And we're not told why. We don't have anything telling us why they killed the Jews who were living in this town. And maybe it's because they were still resisting them. Maybe it's because the Jews in this town had their allegiance was to the Midianites. Maybe they were traitors. I don't know. I can only speculate there. Then, then, then we jump a little bit and, and Gideon addresses two Midianite kings that they had captured. And uh, he says, describe for me the two men you killed over near Mount Tabor. And they say, well, actually, they, they kind of look like you. And he reveals, Gideon reveals, these were my brothers. If you would have spared their lives, I would now spare yours. And he says to his oldest, oldest son, who was probably quite young, he says, rise up and kill them. And, and uh, the young boy hesitated and these two kings began mocking him begin mocking Gideon saying that you know he's basically he's a your son's a coward and so are you so uh, Gideon gets up and he puts an end to that he, he kills him himself At verse 22 it says then the men of Israel said to Gideon rule over us both thou and thou son and thy son's son also for thou hast delivered us from the hand of Midian. Here you see what is perhaps the very beginning of Israel's desire to have a human, a human king like other nations. Uh, this is the desire that would lead us to eventually King Saul and King David. So because of the victory, because they were liberated, they wanted to get him to become the king over Israel and to set up this dynasty that his sons would follow him and then his grandsons. And verse 23, it says, And Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. The Lord shall rule over you. Gideon understood that God was the king of Israel. He understood that. Gideon understood that every victory of Israel begin or belonged to God. He said, the Lord rule over you. I'm not going to rule over you, neither is my son, neither are my grandsons. And then, then Gideon asked him for, for some of the loot that they'd taken. He asked him for the earrings of the, of the Midianites, the gold earrings that be his share of plunder. That's all he wanted. And if you 
if you do a, a little study, you find out that they're equated to 50 pounds of gold. Can you imagine having 50 pounds of gold? And verse 27 says, And the Gideon made an ephod thereof and put it in a city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel went thither a whoring after it, which thing became a snare to get in into his house. So this ephod, what is an ephod? Ephod was a was a uh, a piece of clothing. It would, probably had a solid gold breastplate and gold chain mail. Probably hung about to the knees. So uh, Gideon turned his 50 pounds of gold into this and it hung there and people begin to worship. Uh, it should give you comfort that you're not the only numbskulls that have ever faced, been on the face of the earth. <laughs> people so easily led astray, aren't they? That, that they, they see something shiny and, and uh, that becomes their, their point of their desire. It became a tourist attraction, basically. The, the, the people of Israel started, have you heard about the golden ephod that Gideon had? You need to go see that. And they, they wanted to begin to worship it. And I don't think that was ever Gideon's intention, but it became a snare to him. Verse 28 says, Thus was Midian subdued before the children of Israel, so that they lifted up their heads no more, and the country was in quietness 40 years in the days of Gideon. So you look at Gideon's... Uh, time as a judge and he'd say his judgeship over Israel was uh, largely successful if the judge is to be a liberator. But if you look at his life in a lot of ways he was a spiritual failure. If you really look at the end of this chapter his, his, he let wealth become his undoing. He, he goes. He he turns fifty pounds of gold into this ephod, which people start to worship. It goes from that to having a harem of wives and concubines who give him seventy sons. Verse thirty-one it says, "And the concubine that was in Shechem, she also bare him a son, whose name he called Abimelech, which means the name means my father is king." And getting to some Joash died in a good old age and was buried in the sepulcher of Joash his father in Ophrah of the Abizertes. Now, now, as you read this, you, you should see, you should pay attention and see that Gideon had 70 sons by all these wives and concubines, and one of them was named, just one was named, one of 70. You should ask yourself why, and, and in that naming, you can see something of Gideon in his late life, too, that he named his son, my father is king, even though he denied being king, even though he said he would not, his sons would not, his grandsons were not. Then he turns around and names one of these boys, my father is king. Show some about what wealth did to get in late in his life. They thought too much of himself. And, and as we continue our study, we'll see that Abimelech also had then desires of being king. That the exact thing that Gideon had at one time rightly said we will not do was was starting to form. So, uh, in, in Gideon's life, you see a man who slipped from the great heights of faith faith to, I think, a place of maybe nearing apostasy. That he he hadn't, he hadn't maintained his relationship with God, and he let riches bring him down. And if we're not careful, this is this is exactly what we can do. And it's like I talked earlier on this morning about big churches, that uh, too much, too many times wealth ruins that thing. But they've forgotten how to depend on God. They've forgotten how to praise God, to give God credit. You know, it's not enough for us to be. It's not good enough for us. It's not good enough for you to be in good standing with God right now. You've got to continue. You've got to finish this journey. In this, in this relationship with God, you've got to finish well. Now, Gideon, was, was, Gideon was really good. He was really right there with God. He was really faithful to God for a moment in time. But he got to a place in life where to see anything of God moving in his life, he had to work, look backwards. You don't ever want to get in that place where you've got to look backwards to see anything God's doing in your life. And God's not just behind you, he's ahead of you. He's not just behind you in struggle, he's ahead of you in glory. 
verse 33, it says, And it came to pass as soon as Gideon was dead that the children of Israel turned again and went a whoring after Balaam. Of course they did, because that's what they do. And made Balbareth their God, and the children of Israel remembered not the Lord their God, who had delivered them out of the hands of all their enemies on every side. Neither showed they kindness to the house of Jerubbabel, namely Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had showed to Israel. And that's the history of Gideon. How, how quickly people forget. How quickly they forgot what Gideon had done and how quickly, more importantly, they forgot what God had done in their lives. And where are you at today? What have you seen God do in your life and how often do you think about it? You can't let go. You can't allow any space between you and him. So let's pray as we close. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we would ask that, that you begin to build more faith in us. Oh, we thank you through this past week of difficulty that you've been with us every step of the way and you've showed yourself strong. Uh, we're thankful that we know that if we pair ourselves with you, we are in an overwhelming, overpowering majority. And you do care for us. And Father, teach us, teach us, give us your Holy Spirit and teach us how to have more faith. Give us eyes that we can see in the spiritual realm. Give us a heart for obedience. Give us the audacity to share the gospel. Father, help us to be change makers for your kingdom. Enlarge us, O oh Lord, spiritually. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.